I, I'm very excited to know how rehearsals have gone. Uh, very, yeah, very well, thank you. Yes, it's, it's been, uh, you know, it's, it's quite a lot of music to fit in, although in actual time length, it's not that much, but it's lots of different styles. Uh, and in fact, we're sort of, we were saying yesterday, we're playing in four different styles for this programme. Um, yes. uh, so that in some ways is the hardest thing, is getting the brain into gear for each, each piece. But, but exactly. uh, with, with that in mind, it's, uh, it's fantastic. And it's fantastic to hear the uh, sort of dialogue between the pieces and the periods from which they come. Uh, which is something that I don't often get the chance to do myself. And I, I think it's a really worthwhile sort of musical experience, yeah. The Concerto de Grosse has also got this American feel to it. Well, it absolutely, yeah. Fun, yeah. Or, although some parts of it, the, 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 you know, the regular string writing, in a very odd re way, reminds me of the Elgar um, string into, you know, introduction Allegro, uh, which has something of the same sort of energy to it. So there is a sort of Englishy tradition that we inherit through Corelli and uh, through Handel in particular, and then later through Britain and uh, other composers of that, of that period. Is that the too, triads? Well, is it, is it yeah, yes, it's, yeah, 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 it's, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, yeah. So, so, yeah, you can hear American, English, and obviously Italian, Italian, Italian influences there in that respect, which makes it a very interesting dialogue because people assume often that Baroque music is all one style, you know, when in fact it itself is constantly borrowing from um, many different types of style, you know, high or low, uh, however we define those terms. Um, yes. And that's exactly what happens here. It's, it's like a piece that borrows, borrows from several national traditions and, uh, and puts them together. Um, and the Concerto Grosso idea, of course, I think is, is a very good one for dialogue. You know, it gets a, not just a dialogue between the solos and the orchestra, but among the soloists as well. It's a, a very flexible, Yes. and sort of friend, friendly version of the concerto genre you know it's not you don't feel that you're you're being bossed around by one single soloist but their virtuosity as it were enhances everyone and uh, that's why i think in particularly in that first moment where you have those little episodes which bring in a different character um it, re it really uh, is is an excellent um uh, combination of uh, uh, ideas but but also it's like a like a sort of conversation between people Yes, I mean it was originally composed for orchestra, uh, commissioned by orchestra as a swan, and I was meant to. Be, it was for me to play that piano part because mm. actually I think piano is a very hard instrument to f really fit in with a small group of string. It, yeah, I was yeah. worried about it dominating, so that's why it's quite. Um, I use it quite judiciously. The piano. Yes, yeah, and actually in the acoustic we're doing it, in the, in the church acoustic, the, the piano does slap, slap off the walls quite ni nicely, which actually I think gives hopefully the, the, the sort of effect you need without too much effort. It's, it's a, quite a joyful work, isn't it? And the other thing, John, I was going to say, uh, as a school kid, you know, we really look quite closely at the, um, well, well, we studied the bar, Brandenburg and Jesus, but also, yeah, yeah. also the handle. You know, yeah, so yeah, like yeah. 13, 14, we were really, yeah. they really, that was sort of, I feel that's part of my, um, mm. my musical identity in a way. Yeah, and which was the orchestra that taught us all those pieces originally. It's quite often going to be the Academy of St. Martins in the Fields. It's uh, one year older than me, and so I sort of feel as, as if I sort of grew up with it in a way, you know, so it's, it makes it such a life, lovely experience for me to sort of go back. Uh, uh, well, not go back to them, if you said I mean, but uh, be introduced to them. Yeah, yeah really, really great. No, this, I think, is a very, very exciting collaboration. Yes. Yeah. And your your point about the Concerto Grosso and the uh, you know thinking of Baroque precedents. Um, I think, particularly of your last movement, where where uh, although it's a very regular ostinato most of the time, not all the time, um, there's several things that challenge it. You know, we get, we get a sort of another piece suddenly comes in at one point, which is absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, the ground bass keeps changing just in the in the last few minutes of the piece, few seconds of the piece, and it's uh, almost as if you're um, uh, seeing how far you can push the form, you know, it's uh, exactly yes. what Bach, for instance, was doing in the Fifth Brandenburg Concerto. Uh, he has something that looks symmetrical and seems to be logical and civilised, but uh, just pushed beyond where it ought to go in a way, and it's so successfully as well, really. I mean, the last mo movement is sort of just verging on the chaotic. For example, there's yeah. suddenly this, that material that comes in, which is actually more 19th century and just yeah. wrong, yeah. really. And then Definitely. the very end, it does. I spent ages with that ending thinking this sounds so abrupt, but I didn't mean it to feel as if we're suddenly a rocket taking off and we've sort of, you know, it's best to stop yeah, now. Yes. 
<laughs> yeah, no, it's very effective. I mean, it's a, you, you feel there's a threat of anarchy, but uh, uh, but yes. it's a it's a sort of joyful bang, really, isn't it? At the end, yeah. it's really really a lovely, lovely bit. Yeah, oh uh, yeah, I'm interested in that that sort of nineteenth century interjection, yeah, because uh, one of the other things we're doing in the program is Britain's edition of the Chacon by Purcell. So it actually doesn't have any notes by Britain in it, but it has all these performance markings which we're trying to follow. So we're actually trying to get that sort of sixties fifties style as well as one of the styles we do because it's so important for his composition and for the sound world uh, of yeah. that time and of the early early years of the academy too um so that's that's our fourth style so we've got sort of 17th century english with a bit of french in it uh we've got um 18th century english stroke uh, italian um we've got 1960s english and and then we've got uh 21st century wallen <laughs> <laughs> They all dialogue with one another, though, and that's that's what really interests me about this this program is that that you know it's not just the pieces of music that play off one another, but also the styles. You can sort of see how different ages have slightly different rhetorics, you know, ways of trying to persuade people. Uh, and obviously, we're never going to you know uh, do a facsimile of each particular style. But I think to hear the differences or an attempt at the differences uh, is is hugely interesting for where we are at the moment. And of course, um, you know, Corelli was a big influence for me on on this because his music is so fresh, isn't it? And it takes yeah. simple elements. And I always say about the I always say about rock music in general that's sort of the to me is the precursor of the rhythm section in a in a jazz band. You know, it, it, everything moves from the bass, doesn't it? Obviously. Well, absolutely, yes, yes. That that that, that bass generated energy is is so so important, and <clears throat> it's still technically there in the in the late eighteenth century and into the nineteenth century, but. Uh, you tend to sort of forget it after a while and then it sort of starts to come back in the early 20th century with what well, particularly neoclassicism i suppose but yes, uh, yes. Uh, which is a sort of more mechanical version of it but uh, but not not any weaker because of that um but yeah that's really interesting that that whole issue of corelli because uh, i think he on paper he tried to set himself out as a as a sort of very pure and, and you almost feel that the music is hugely refined although very lively and very sonorous very harmonious uh yet as a performer he was apparently completely crazy you know and went went absolutely wild so this this again this sort of um dialogue between what you see as composed written out music and what you might hear and how you might hear it and uh, uh i was just saying to the orchestra yesterday that the handle we're doing which is very much in the corellian style could easily sound very dull because it does have a huge number of formulae in it but if you actually see the formulae as as part of an ongoing uh, dance and conversation simultaneously, that really gives it an energy. And uh, in fact, having played your piece just before that final handle, I think will be an excellent way of catalyzing uh, that that sort of um, um, energy that, that, that the Baroque style really ought to have and sometimes doesn't. <laughs> oh, how exciting, yeah. how exciting. And the thing about uh, the whole program is that, I, you know, I think about Baroque music, it, it is such an, fantastic wellspring to this day isn't it for composers even composers working uh, not tonally yeah well i think it sort of speaks to so many other genres you know in the in the popular jazz fields and uh, other sort of non-western fields that have a have a sort of uh, complex but regular rhythmic structure to them so i think it it actually does join together traditions in ways that uh, perhaps some 19th century war horses although they seek to be very universal in their speaking to humankind, they don't necessarily have have that particular aspect of of, and I think it's the notion of movement really. Yeah. Uh, so and often dance. in the classic, yeah. yeah, exactly. So often in the classical tradition, we think of it as being something that goes on in the mind, which of course it does, and it's wonderful that it does. Uh, but we sometimes forget that everybody actually also has a body, even if they're not necessarily using it. You still sort of. I was saying, I was, there's one passage I think in your piece actually yesterday where I said that they need to. Uh, it's a simple string crossing passage that I said, but they need to make it sound actually as if it's quite difficult, so it has a real sort of athleticism, oh, wow. athleticism to it. You you know, uh, and that's that athleticism is something that a listener can pick up. That notion of of a player leaping from one end of the instrument to the other, even if the actual exercise in this particular case was relatively simple. Uh, but but yeah, feeling that I think is is something that that is there in all all music and and uh, and particularly in in this type of music that has a lot of movement going on in it. Yeah. And John, I was thinking that there's there has been a trend of or maybe for a long time for composers to write companion in pieces to old pieces 
Yes. Is, yes. Um, and I suppose this was one of one of them. Yeah, well, as you as you know, I'm a Bruckner fanatic. So, uh, <laughs> Bruckner writes companion symphonies to the symphonies he's written already. About five of them, quite often, which is very, very confusing. But <laughs> yeah, that 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 was sort of born at, in a certain sense of neurosis. Uh, but there are other composers, particularly in the 20s and 21st centuries, I think, who who yeah do like the idea of uh, of pairing pairing their styles and, and sort of looking back uh, to where we are. And yeah. of course, in our case, we have your new opera just coming up, Dido's Ghost. Yes, which again is Purcell a complete Purcell opera embedded within a completely new piece. Um, but it's funny, working with the Purcell now, it's making me understand people like Britton and Tippett more. It's yeah, funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You understand why they're so enthusiastic about the way it's sort of nearly tonalities we know, but, the, but mm. it's got this other hinterland, which is very... Uh, fascinating. Yeah, the background to uh, modality, uh, dances that are out of fashion or, you know, we didn't know there were. Uh, there, there are all sorts of things like that which are sort of part of everyday life for them, uh, which are sort of refreshing our, our own age, you know. And uh, yeah, of course, Britain and Tippett were, were real pioneers in this regard, as indeed was the Academy of St. Martin's. So it's, uh, uh, it's, it's interesting to think of that uh, uh, because uh, you know, there's often the common thought that, that people get jaded after a while, you know, that, that we, Baroque music is old hat now. But in fact, hearing how it was first uh, became popularised in the 60s, 50s, 60s and so on, uh, is, is to my mind very, very important because it sort of explains so many other things that are going on in music uh, in our uh, recent past. Remind them that they've got to dig deep into their James Brown souls as well. <laughs> okay, yes, yes, yes. Johnny, do you know? Yeah. Johnny, do you know who James Brown is, Johnny? I, I know the name, yes, yeah, and I can imagine. I, I have a very good picture in my ear uh, as to how deep he might well have dug. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> to mix a few metaphors. 